Well, Ken Wyatt, Linda Burney, thank you both for joining us this morning. Let's start on this issue of the voice to Parliament. Minister, to you first. The Uluru Statement three years ago was quite clear that the voice to Parliament should be enshrined in the Constitution. Why has the government rejected that? What's the actual concern? Well, it's good to be with you, David. The the, there wasn't a concern in respect to having a voice to government or to Parliament. It was about the way the voice was not defined in that statement. And the consultation process that I've established, uh, the response from community about having local vo voices heard to address their issues has been the most predominant element of the work that is being done by the regional and local voice um, committees that I established. And that's, I see that all the time when I'm out on the ground. People say nobody's listening to us, not even our peak leadership comes out, looks at the issues and challenges we face and then advocate for us. Yeah, and I want to come to that, but why not enshrine it in the Constitution? Can you just explain why that element's been rejected? Well, I think there's a couple of elements to this, David. One is, if you fail on a question for a constitutional referendum, it is never resurrected. We only have to look at eight have been successful against 42 attempts. I don't want this to fail. So it's the we fear of, it's the fear of the losing right the referendum that's, that means you won't, you won't attempt it? No, no, it's also having the right words uh, because the interpretation by the High Courts in many instances come into significant play. And we saw that with Section 44, where some very good members of Parliament, because of Section 44, lost their seats within the Parliament. Some were successful in being returned. I don't want to have a situation in 20 years' time where that becomes counterproductive. That's from the work that the expert panel did, and we certainly had those discussions in depth. And then the subsequent parliamentary uh, joint select committees that mm. considered these so, so issues that, that as well. So that concern, just to be clear, that the, concern is that it, the, however it's worded in the constitution could make it too powerful? Is that, is that what you're suggesting? No, 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 I'm not saying it's going to be too powerful. What we want is the right set of words. Because as uh, Senator Dodson and Julian Lisa in their report uh, put, the voice was absolutely necessary to hear the voices of all Indigenous Australians. And that's the premise for which we've been working. Now, if and when the legislation occurs and this proves to be successful, then certainly uh, it'll demonstrate that we have a model that works exceptionally well. And on that basis, you would logically uh, look at how you would construct the wording. But we're still doing parallel right. work in respect to constitutional okay. recognition. So the idea is to, is, to legislate, is to legislate the voice. And I think you've said you, you want that done pass through Parliament before the next election, correct? That's my aspiration, okay. but we, we go through the processes as you're fully aware. And I'll come back to that. Linda Burney, uh, you want the voice to be enshrined in the Constitution, that is Labor's position, but does that mean you would vote against actually legislating a body or would you actually prefer to see that happen as a first step? Well, happy NAIDOC week, David, and hi, Ken, and... Uh, to the panel Amen. as well. Uh, Labor endorses and accepts in full what Uluru has said. And that's really important in this discussion, David, is that we don't just focus on the voice. I mean, that's crucial, but we focus on what Uluru actually said. It said, we want an enshrined voice in the constitution. We want a Makarata Commission that would oversee agreement and treaty making and oversee a national process of truth telling. That is what Labor is committed to wholeheartedly and I want to really underscore that. We've always, always said as well that we will be informed by the co-design process and that's critical as well and we have not moved away from that position for a very long period of time. Uh, spoken about this week by Anthony Albanese, myself, and the Shadow Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus. OK, but, but going to, to your yeah, just to be clear on this question, point, yes. Going to your specific point, uh, Ken has spoken to me and he's just told you that his aspiration is to have a legislated voice um, before the next elec election 
put in place. And the question, of course, to Labor, uh, would Labor support that? Uh, can I be very clear that we will look extremely carefully and talk to people about whether that is a step in the right direction. And it can be only a step because the Uluru Statement is very clear on what the aspirations are and very clear on saying, come with us, Australia, and walk on the journey with us. OK, so you are open to legislating a body, uh, depending on what you see, before the election, would you want some sort of time frame around when then it would go into the constitution, Linda Burney? I, I would hope that there was a time frame. And the, the really important point is this, David, it is not too late for the government to do this. Uh, Ken has his reports now, and I, I respect that going out to consultation. But the government and the Prime Minister has the opportunity still in front of it to leave one of the most astounding legacies any Prime Minister could. And I can't understand why he's being so stubborn in that. Just this week, in NAIDOC week, we saw the government introduce a permanency bill around the cashless debit card and we saw them vote down uh, the display of the Aboriginal flags in the Senate. I'll come to those. Unbelievable in NAIDOC week. I'll come to those, but just back to this point, Ken Wyatt. Um, you have now received the report. You've, you've, you've had it for a few weeks now from um, uh, Marcia Langton and Tom Carmer on, on the various options and you were talking there about local and regional and national voice uh, models. You have a number of models before you, but you will ultimately take one of them to Cabinet, is that correct? And can I ask, do any of the models you've been given include enshrining in the Constitution or not? David, the report uh, is very comprehensive and the reflections by the regional and local uh, bodies I've been extremely impressed with the work that they've done because I appointed people with contrasting views, including those very strongly supportive of the Uluru Statement. But they've also been very pragmatic and the next step, of course, is the government process, a discussion within Cabinet, releasing the report and then allowing the second stage of consultation to occur mm -hmm. as to the right models that our people will choose and recommend to government, and then we take the next step from there. So who's, who's making the decision on this? Ultimately, it's, it's you and the Cabinet? Well, it ultimately is in any, whether it's Linda's party or our party, ultimately Cabinet and government of the day do make mm. the decision, but it takes into consideration the voices in this instance of Indigenous Australians right across the nation. But that's what I'm, I'm trying to establish. Uh, which is comprehensive. Sure. Uh, but does, do, do the options you've been given include enshrining in the Constitution or not? Well, those are in the report. When you'll, you'll see that, David, when I release the report. I don't want to preempt uh, what's in the report before uh, Cabinet discusses that report and then uh, I'm quite happy to talk with you at a later stage about some of the options. Can I just turn to, uh, there was a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, a Productivity Commission report that was scathing of the way um, some $35 billion a year is being spent in Indigenous funding for various programs. The, the, the lack of evidence around how effective this spending is, is what it went to. It called for a, a new Office of Indigenous Policy Evaluation uh, to be set up and an all Indigenous council to monitor, monitor its work to make sure money is being spent effectively. Um, do either of you think that's a good idea and how might it sit alongside a voice to parliament or could this be something the voice to parliament does? Linda Burney. It could be something that the voice to parliament does. Um, I think there is so many arguments for a permanent constitutionally enshrined voice, including negotiating a treaty, including making sure that the funds expended in, uh, First Nation, in the First Nations space, uh, not just by uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet, but right across the big government agencies that have some responsibility in this area, be it health okay. or education. It seems to me, David, that one of the really critical things is that, that funding needs to be based on evidence and what was clear from the report is that that is not the case. I can assure you uh, that, uh, uh, that from my perspective and my experience, 
says that you have to have a good ed- evidence base for the expenditure of public funds. Ken White, is that something The Voice, this new body, could do, oversee all spending on Indigenous programs? Well, they can certainly uh, question and have a voice in respect to what that money is. I think one of the fundamental challenges we've got, David, is that we talk about this $30.5 billion, but when I worked in two different state governments, we looked at what the discrete uh, the spending was on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but then it was calculated by some departments on the percentage of the population of their jurisdiction as to how much they were spending uh, that went in the Productivity Commission report. I'd like them to drill down on that $30.5 billion to identify what is actually spent and then what funding is a citizenship entitlement, such as Social Security? What is a citizenship entitlement that any Australian would have as opposed to very directed funding for mm. programs that are targeting closing the gap strategies and addressing the disparity that exists? Can I turn to the issue? And David, yeah, sorry, the disparity, uh, just going on from what uh, Ken has said, Uh, the disparity in uh, the life choices and chances for First Nations people in this country is shocking. Um, And I think there's almost, as Mick Dodson described, an industrial deafness about the shocking statistics, be it children in detention, be it uh, domestic violence, be it uh, the amount of people uh, in terms of overcrowding, hospitalisations, uh, educational outcome, the list goes on. And it is not just about funding. It has a lot to do with funding, but it's about governments taking their full responsibility, both the federal and the state governments. And it does mean that uh, areas like education and health, um, law and justice, actually recognise that they have a responsibility in this area at first. It's intolerable. I mean, if we could just see every community get clean water and every baby being born at the proper weight, just imagine what needs to change in terms of those KPIs to make those two things happen. Can I just go to a couple of other issues? David, brief- just... Sorry, yes, Minister, just, just briefly. Uh, David, I was just going to say on that, Linda's comments are very valid and they were the comments I made during the week. We have to look at the pragmatism of what we change, but I want to see Aboriginal people engaged in the implementation of those programs on the ground because we have been doing things to our people over decades and we've not seen the changes, even if funding was the issue. Okay. We do not see substantial change. Just on a couple of other matters briefly, uh, when we talk about change, uh, I think you both support a change in the wording of the national anthem and Gladys Berejiklian, and the New South Wales Premier has, has supported this as well during the week, changing it from we are young and free to we are one and free. Uh, Minister, what actually needs to happen for an official change in the anthem? Well, I think we've got to have the discussions around what is the right word. I, I, I supported uh, last week when I said that Gladys's suggestion was a good one, but we also don't uh, need to continue to change uh, in a way that uh, somebody else then finds another reason to change another set of words. We have to have the discussion, we have to have the debate, and we have to get this right, because it is our national anthem. There are some people who may not like it, they may want other options, but this is a national anthem that took us away from God Save the Queen to our own anthem, which I think has given us a strong identity when we're at international events. And, but we've changed it before. And wording we, we, is something. We changed the, the wording Oh, we have changed before, it before. Yes. Australian sons to Australians all. So it can happen again. Well, there's always options and governments will consider those. It doesn't matter who's the government. Okay. Governments have the options to consider those. All right, final one. Uh, the theme for NAIDOC week has been, uh, always was, always will be, Uh, And look, um, it is uh, quite historic, of course, that we have Indigenous representatives in the two roles that you occupy. But there are limits, aren't there, to your influence? Because another issue this week was whether or not the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag should be flown in the Senate chamber. Again, I think it's something you both support, but it didn't happen. Uh, Linda Burney, why not? Well, you'll have to ask why the government voted against this. I just 
find it remarkable. Um, as you know, David, and people watching uh, know, I spent 13 years in the New South Wales Parliament uh, before coming to Canberra, um, and uh, both in the Assembly and in the Senate, uh, the flags have been flying for many years, uncontroversial and uh, really a, a very, very decent right. thing. At the end of the day, David, we have in this country a remarkable story of 65,000 years. Everyone should be proud of that. And that's what anthems and that's what flags help us do. Final word from you then, Minister, on why that flag couldn't be flown in the Senate. Well, that was a decision for the Senate and there was a vote uh, on the floor and the decision was to retain the status quo. But David, one thing I want to point out is when you look at the Southern Cross, it is the story of the Seven Sisters. It is the story of the Eagle's Foot. It is the story that is associated with certain communities across this nation, even the Yolanyu people with the canoe. All of that is culturally reflected in what we do. Now the flag, if I would rather see it flying out the front where the public see it because the number of people who come into question time are not a significantly high number. And I'm proud of the Australian flag, but I am as equally proud of the Aboriginal flag because it represents what we've fought for, what we've mm. obtained and what unites us. And Harold's, in discussions with Harold, uh, that's come back plenty of times in terms of the unity of the three colours that are important to All us. Right. We are going to have to leave it there. Ken White, Linda Burney, thank you both very much for uh, uh, coming on together uh, this morning at the end of NAIDOC week. Appreciate that. Ha happy NAIDOC. <laughs> Indeed. Happy NAIDOC week.